of all. If you could see the rainbow on the bulletin cover, would you please raise your hand? That's not bad. And, and good to see it. It's very, very sudden. It's very difficult to go and capture a rainbow. When you see Robert Ford this week, tell him thank you for helping Mark with the rainbow because I was out in the garden and I said, Robert, bring the hose pipe over here and turn the sprayer on and hold it at this certain angle while I try to capture a rainbow. And by the time we were done, Bob was like this. And I said, okay, just a couple more shots and, and we'll be done. So thank Robert. It's a very simple but like the rainbow is a subtle thing sometimes, it's hard to see. Uh, we're doing Noah again today because it's the story that matches up with the Sunday School curriculum, stories about water, but we have a different angle. Of course, the story of Noah is very simple, right? It's, um, everybody knows it, and if you don't, you, you can just listen to the Irish rovers sing it. Now a long time ago, when the earth was green, there are more kinds of animals than you've ever seen. We had cats and bats and elephants, the shirt was here born, but the loveliest of all was the ewe and corn. And you know, the whole, the whole story is right there. And more children's songs have been written about Noah's Ark than I think any other kind of story. Before in came the animals, two by two, the elephants loved and the kangaroo. Kangaroo was always big in the Nova stories because there were a lot of kangaroos in Palestine at the time. <laughs> God told no one to build an archaeology. God told no one to build an archaeology out of sticks and We all know it. So, now, and more jokes and children's wallpaper. Everybody knows our simple. I want to say to you, Noah's Ark isn't simple. It's, it's about the most deep and theologically profound concept in all of Scripture and in all of Christendom is contained within the story of Noah's Ark. And the meaning of the story has very little connection to the Ark and the animals. They're just incidental things to illustrate the point that the author is trying to make. But like with so many Bible stories, we latch on to the thing that is obvious and colorful and superficial and we cling to it and we can never ever let it go. I want you to think differently about the ark this morning. Uh, think about how complicated the story is. First of all, if I say to you how many of each animal were on the ark, you know, well two. Uh, Genesis 6, 19 to 22, take two of each kind of animal aboard with you. But then you move on one sentence, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, and, and God tells Noah, take seven pairs of every clean animal, 14 of every clean animal, one pair of every unclean animal, and seven pairs of every different type of bird. So 14 of most animals, 14 of all the birds, two of the unclean animals. But then one sentence further on is back to two of each, once again. And you struggle along with that, maybe a translator made a mistake. <laughs> no, it's not. It's that the first five books of the Old Testament come from four different sources, four different authors who all have a different theological emphasis. The Yahwistic author who wrote in 1000 BC, and the Elohistic author who wrote in 800, the priestly author who wrote in 700, and the Deuteronomic author who wrote in 600. And after that, somebody bundled them all together. And it's a very strange thing. But that isn't the complexity I'm talking about. An even deeper complexity and difficulty with the story of the ark is this. It originates around 1000 BC, at a time when everything is going really great for Judah and Israel. They have united as one nation, they have power and wealth as they have never known before. Nobody is trying to kill them, and yet there's a problem. The problem is that they 
there is massive poverty inside Judah and Israel. Poverty exists because there is a wealthy class of people who are getting wealthier and wealthier and they hold the money for themselves and they will not share it. Isn't that a strange and unique situation? And the people in the church began looking around and saying, everything is good. We are so blessed with peace and unity and prosperity. Why don't we look after each other? Why aren't human beings loving and kind even towards their neighbor? It's a big theological problem. It was the central problem of life 3,000 years ago. It is the central problem of life today. Somebody in that context said, you know what we should do? It would be really neat if God were to wipe out all the bad people and just leave good people on the earth and then we could start again. And if we were to start out again with only the good people, think how wonderful everything would be. And uh, someone began to realize the problem with that story. And the problem with that idea is that you can't take away all the bad people because nobody would be left. Like Certainly not you and me. You'd be, you'd be long gone. And um, so they developed the Noah story in order to say, look, you can't wipe the slate clean and then start over again. And somebody was actually sitting down one day and wanted to illustrate that point. And they said, look, let's suppose that God wiped out the whole with a flood and only save one person or one family. And that was a good family and they said, what would happen? And of course, while he's telling this story, some joker in the back said, well, if that actually happened, um, why do we still have animals here? And the storyteller said, well, uh, the guy who was saved built a boat and he put all the animals on the boat. Two of each, three in pairs, and that's why we still have the animals today. And then he goes on telling, and then this, this smart aleck in the back says, well, how big was the boat? And of course, the storyteller wants to say, look, this isn't the point of the story. He says, I'm just saying that if God wiped out the world, it really wouldn't help us. Okay, how big was the boat? Oh, well, yeah, it was 450 feet long and 45 feet high and 75 feet wide. Now shut up and listen to the story. It goes on. I think, I think that may be how the story of the ark started out. Somebody dealing with the question, why does God wipe out all the bad people? Um, the key for the story is the ark or the animals. The key for the story is Genesis 6 and verse 5 in which God looks down at his people and he says there is much evil in them. All of their thoughts and all of their inclinations are always evil. I am sorry that I ever made them. I am sorry that I ever made them. But see, that isn't so much the voice of God as the voice of the self-righteous person who looks around and says, why is everyone else so sinful? Why am I the only good person left? And the story of Noah deals with that. I think it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Then you get the flood, um, the obedience of Noah, the raven, the dove, the end. And everybody says, this is great. Now we're going to start the world again with one good man and his family. And no one gets drunk and falls down naked and passes out. The storyteller says, there's the good man. And then he curses his grandson for something that his father did. And you can spend the rest of your life, if you wish, trying to figure out the meaning of Noah cursing Canaan, the son of Ham. Good luck to you. You can't start over again. The key to the story is 
when God pretends to say, I'm sorry I ever made them, I will wipe them out. But you see, that's not what God says. Because God knows what we are. God knows, even as Psalm 103 said this morning, God knows that we are made of the dust. God does not deal with us according to our transgressions, but according to the abundance of his love. And what the storyteller is saying to those self-righteous people is, yes, we are all sinful, and you are sinful as well, but get over it. God has you covered in that realm. God loves you, and in spite of your sinfulness, you are able to go out and do things that are good and kind and compassionate and great. So go and do those good things. And forgive yourself if you sin. But that attitude keeps on coming up again and again in the course of human history. Why can't you get rid of the bad people? Surely humankind is capable of being good. In the 4th century AD, there was a theologian from likely Great Britain whose name was Pelagius. And Pelagius took exception to what the church was teaching at the time, which was the doctrine of original sin from St. Augustine or Bishop Augustine of Hippo. And he began to say, no, human beings are capable of being good. And if somebody isn't good, it's because they have chosen to be evil. Need to be rid of all the bad people and only have good people left and restart humankind. In response to what Pelagius said, St. Augustine called the Council of Chalcedon in 418 AD, and the whole purpose of the Council of Chalcedon was to say to the whole world that we in the church understand that people are sinful. God's love has to cover And there was a huge debate between the followers of St. Augustine of Hippo and the followers of Pelagius who said human beings are capable of choosing what is good and being righteous. We just have to weed out the bad ones. And thankfully, the side that supported Augustine won out. Pelagius was declared to be a heretic. He didn't understand the meaning of Noah's Ark, the idea that you can't pretend that there are some good people who could restart a good and holy humanity. The model of St. Augustine, which grew out of the Council of Chalcedon, was a Latin phrase, non possum, non peccare. It should be your model for the rest of your life. It means it is not possible to not sin. It's a double negative. Non possum, non vicare. It is not possible to not sin. We are all fallen. We are all broken. We are all frail. We are sinful and corrupt. Like the psalm says, we are wretches. But get over it. God has forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Recognize that goodness can live in you alongside of the corruption and the fallenness and the brokenness. It's the message of the cross of Calvary. Yes, you have sinned, but my love has no end. And in spite of your sin, you are capable of doing wonderful things. It is the message of Noah's Ark. God is not going to wipe out all of humankind because it doesn't work. We are all broken. But in spite of our brokenness, God loves us. And we are capable of doing wonderful things by God's grace. It is the meaning of that funny story in Matthew 18 where the servant who owes $10 million is forgiven but will not forgive his friend two dollars. Look around us and we see the sin of others. And we say, why is everyone else so sinful? We 
You must remember you have been forgiven $10 billion and the most that anybody else owes you is two bucks. So get over it. Forgive them. Forgive yourself. Recognize that God's wonderful grace can live and prosper in you in spite of your brokenness. Go and live a life filled with healing and genuine compassion and God's mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder if Ocho will... Oh, Ocho is there again today. Thanks for sharing.